Welcome to day 21 of Natural Beauty Summit's Detox Your Beauty Regimen Series. I'm Salome Salehi, founder and president at Sugar Sugar Wax, a clean beauty company. And we are getting really close to the finish line. Now, before I introduce today's guest expert, I just want to give a shout out to all the people that have responded to our survey, which was sent out yesterday. So thank you. Your feedback means so much to us. And honestly, I'm a little overwhelmed at all the positivity. We had set out to bring you, our audience, information that wouldn't necessarily be on the mainstream with the hopes that just one interview can help you feel better in your own skin. And the feedback we've been getting and the stories that you guys have been sharing with us has made the effort well worth it. So if you haven't already, please share. We wanna hear more from you. Now, as we get closer to the end of the summit, you're probably feeling more empowered and more ready to take matters into your own hands. Well, today's expert can help you do just that. Heather Irvine is a longtime herbalist who has spent years in every step of the process, from growing to cultivating to processing plants for medicinal purposes. She not only teaches at the Herbal Academy, which is an international academy of herbal tradition, but she also writes courses for the academy. Today, Heather and I will be talking about the intrinsic connection between us, humans, and plants, and how plants can help us heal. She will also be sharing a pantry recipe for a glowing, soothing skin mask right in the interview. So stay tuned for my discussion with Heather Irvine. Hi everyone, I'm here with Heather Irvine, herbal expert and educator at the Herbal Academy. Um, the courses that the Academy offers are really, really interesting and some of them go super in depth, but we're going to try to focus here with Heather today and just let's start off Heather with just hearing a little bit about the Academy itself because you write the courses, you teach the courses, your role is pretty in, in, in depth and I'd love to hear from you. Um, what can someone expect when they register for a course? Absolutely, yeah, really glad to be here. And it's true, I'm one of many herbalist educators with the group, um, and we've basically developed uh, over the past 10 years um, around a dozen, probably more than a dozen, really comprehensive um, and really detailed herbal education um, offerings, all of them online. And so we do say we're an international school and a global leader in herbal online education. Um, so the courses really range from um, like a comprehensive training program. Um, we have things like an intro and an in intermediate course. Those are both things that someone would spend time with um, like pretty much every week over the course of a year or two years. And then we even have an advanced program that's designed to be a three-year learning program. Um, and that's really designed for someone who would like to be like a clinical herbalist. We also have some entrepreneurial type, um, like an entrepreneurial path. So that um, doesn't necessarily go as advanced, but really features um, sort of advice for someone who might want to like have a product line, but maybe not necessarily be like an herbal clinician. Um, but the one thing I can say is that we really put a lot of care into all the information. So like, you know, each of us in learning have had certain questions where we find like, oh, you know, people sort of glance over that topic or this is just taken for granted. We really try to um, like get at sort of the how and why the herbs work um, and include the science as well as kind of the sort of discussion within the herbal community so that people are really prepared to sort of understand and explain how herbs work. And uh, in terms of sourcing, because with with herbs, it's, it's some things grow like weeds everywhere. 
And then some things are a lot harder to come by. So do you, is the sourcing of herbs also a part of the courses? Definitely. I think at probably, you know, very many points through the courses, we emphasize things like um, sustainability and sort of responsible sourcing. And I feel like almost every, you know, almost everything we write, we're sort of incorporating, you know, this, this particular plant may have like a lot of press about it or a lot of sort of uh, buzz, you know, and it's, it's great because it's effective, but there are often, you know, different plants that are as good as or better than um, as far as sort of functionality and use that ecologically are more sustainable. And so we really encourage our students to, you know, to know not just like five or six herbs, you know, there are hundreds um, and to really get to know how to use, you know, whatever number of herbs you're going to learn about to really sort of learn all their applications as well as sort of like cultural context and sustainability context. That's yeah. awesome. That's so important. Mm-hmm. And it's um, definitely something that's been more on my horizon as well, especially during the interviews in the series and talking about toxicity. It's um, it, there is definitely a sustainability consideration when you're sourcing ingredients and product. Um, I want to get right into skincare because you actually have a course dedicated to botanical skincare. But before you talk about the course, I want to get a little bit of insight from you about, are you finding that now that people are at home, they're wanting to do more of this DIY stuff or how has COVID and the whole sheltering in place culture changed um, your work or your students? Definitely, uh, definitely very applicable to us. So we have had, we already had a lot of interests. We have very, very many students, but certainly at the beginning of sort of stay at home orders or concerns about, um, you know, heightened concerns about health and immunity, um, we had a real surge in interest partially from uh, people who were already enrolled. You know, we saw sort of all of a sudden everybody's working on their assignments and everyone sort of, um, you know, had more questions or were sort of coming up with more ideas and reaching out um, and also finding it to be a nice community to be a part of. And that was true for us as, as, you know, as employees or educators too, to be able to have this community where even if people are stressed, we're trying to kind of be positive and sort of, we, we're all there for sort of the same reasons. Um, but we certainly have seen a real increase in new participants as well. So um, that has been good for us and I think good for people who are um, maybe a little restless and hoping to also um, sort of make something good of this time and be able to take care of themselves and their families, absolutely. For sure. Okay, so tell us about the skincare course. Yeah, so the skincare course is actually quite in depth. Um, I was a contributor to it, but actually didn't realize until recently just how super in depth it is, um, having seen all the many parts of it. Um, So basically in it, we cover, I mean, it could keep you busy for, I would say many months in pretty active, um, you know, pretty actively engaged with learning and doing recipes. Um, So we go over um, all of kind of the, you know, the fundamentals, but in in quite a bit of detail. So things like the physiology of the skin, you know, why someone might call a remedy like heating or cooling, um, different ways of knowing like dry or oily skin types, things of that nature, and then really kind of match that with some of the herbal philosophies. So I found that interesting, Um, but also super in-depth about like the physiology and also in in terms you can understand sort of how the skin works and how the skin might be responding to certain herbs, substances, also oils, because those are things, you know, oils aren't always, um, they're kind of part of herbalism for sure, but not all Western herbalists are as versed in those. So um, it really goes through and compares why you might prefer one ingredient or another, um, precautions as far as, you know, reactions of different skin types, that sort of thing. And then we, we definitely have a really big piece on um, both diet and herbs. So like how, how the skin is so affected by what we do on the inside um, as far as foods. Um, and certainly herbs are incorporated in that as well. 
And so what I find is that a lot of times people know like one or two foods that are supposed to be like so good for the skin, right? And people are so excited about them, but like, can one really say why? <laughs> so we try to really, you know, go through with like the phytochemistry um, and kind of describe, you know, the sort of nuanced benefits and differences. Can and then probably, us, yeah. Sorry, can yeah. you give us an example? Yeah, so, um, so I know you and I were talking a little bit about liver health. So we might, um, might just like pause there. So, um, you know, we'll often hear people say that promoting liver health or detoxification is going to benefit the skin. And I think absolutely a lot of the times that we see, you know, especially like chronic issues uh, or things cropping up on the skin that we see on the outside, perhaps the liver is not um, getting its full uh, benefit of being able to properly do detoxification, whether that's from outside inputs, hormonal imbalances, not enough sleep, stress, et cetera, any of those can sort of be a cause. Um, but there are actually herbs that, as well as foods, but particularly herbs that are known to kind of activate the liver's detoxification processes. So historically, traditionally, this was observed, but it's been documented as well. Um, things that seem to sort of like sort of kick both the digestive and eliminative and sort of liver detoxif detoxification process into gear. Um, so there are quite a few, a few of them I have on the table, but to put on your skin. Um, but examples would be like yellow dock root, um, which is a really bitter herb, but that's actually part of the action too. Literally tasting bitter um, has a sort of historical evolutionary effect on us of sort of, um, you know, telling the body we better, this is something a little different, we better kind of um, prepare to handle this different kind of plant. Um, and so what we see are many herbs which are safe to consume, but because of that bitter flavor, sort of wake up our, our detox process a little bit. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. And in the course, now it sounds like if it's gonna, if I'm just interested, I'm just, um, you know, like for me, for example, I have sensitive skin and I mean, my story is a little different because I found a lot of products didn't work for me. So I went and started a line, but that's a different story. But someone like me who has sensitive skin and really isn't sure about what to use and wants to take a more natural approach is this course too in depth? Like, do I need to know all of that? Or is it something that like, you can kind of take it at your own pace? Yeah, I would say that because it's like home study and sort of on your own pace, um, you can take what you need from it. We do sometimes get, um, you know, hear from students who are very diligent and a little bit stressed sort of by their own pressures on themselves to like, you know, learn every line. Um, but it's certainly something that you can get what you need from it. Certainly people, you know, I think probably everyone listening, watching has some foundation in skincare, which is probably much longer and deeper than my own personally, but you can probably um, sort of advance to the sections on the uses of particular herbs and kind of identify some sort of new like best tools and best friends for you personally. Um, and that's kind of what the sort of fourth and fifth sections of the course are. So gotcha. Or herb portfolio, or um, we call them monographs, but basically descriptions of how the herbs are used and why, um, you know, information that would tell you, you know, for sensitive skin, or this is a bit more potent. And then of course, like formulating and blending as well. Right. And um, in terms of the, um, I guess what uh, students are required to do, like are there tests or anything like that? So for some of our courses, for what we call the foundational courses, um, like the beginner, intermediate, and advanced, there are quizzes. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not particularly certain if there are for the skincare course. I think there are some, but um, not quite as extensive. So sort of like little checkpoints, you know, that you've gotten the key takeaways. Um, it sort of depends. Some of our courses, we offer a certificate, the foundational courses, others right. we offer a badge. And so those are a little bit lighter on, um, you know, sort of what you have to do in order to access the rest of the info. What are some of the conditions that you guys can, um, that 
you include or address in the course? Yeah, so I'd say that most of us are kind of um, sort of more like clinic, like the writers, you know, the teachers are kind of clinical herbalists or family herbalists a little bit more so than coming from like, um, like a beauty care perspective, although we have some contributors from that world as well. Um, so we have covered a lot of the sort of really common issues. So things like acne, eczema, um, you know, dandruff, rashes, issues that, you know, we get from being outdoors, like, you know, sunburn, bug bites, things of that nature. It's a little bit more, um, I'd say kind of like, like, <laughs> and sort of addressing sort of the common, you know, common ailments. Um, although certainly a lot of these things are going to definitely kind of enliven the skin as well and help with things like repair. So, yeah. And now that summer is upon us, we're spending so much more time in the sun. Now in the series, we have talked about sunscreen, but we haven't really talked about sunburns. Is there a remedy you can share with us? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll keep it pretty simple. Um, I will say we also in the course go into like why bioflavonoids are so good for us to take, you know, to be eating internally because those can have some protective benefits. But when it comes to sunburn, I'd say we probably have many different recipes in here, but really like simple, like good old fashioned aloe vera because it's, I would say proven. Um, something, things really gentle like rose hydrosol because we know that's going to be super gentle, hydrating, anti-inflammatory. Um, and I've also really liked lavender. Um, so those are ones, you know, most people have heard of. There's also an herb called um, yarrow, which some may be familiar with, um, that I think is really excellent as well. It's a little bit, um, I don't know, I guess I would say it's a little astringent, but not super astringent and drying and seems to have a nice kind of like anti-inflammatory effect. Um, offhand, I don't, I can't think of like a recipe from here, but I would say, you know, you can't really go wrong with, um, just combining like maybe two of those ingredients, like maybe right. the hydrosol of rose and a little bit of lavender oil, or perhaps, um, you know, aloe and a preparation of, of the yarrow, yarrow and right. aloe. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of like at the root of what you teach. It's about understanding the properties of the botanical so that you know when you're talking about inflammation or you know burn or redness you know you want to calm and heal and recover the skin and that's um having that basic understanding can just help you whip something up quickly yeah i would say that's it you know you might think of like we have some lotion recipes and things of that but you might think of um sort of what we can add to a sort of skincare, like an already good skincare knowledge is a couple kind of um, potent and tried and true sort of herbal additions. Awesome. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about mushrooms because you have a whole very comprehensive course dedicated to mushrooms. And I know that in some, um, you know, cleanse and practices, some mushrooms, like certain mushrooms, play a role in detoxifying the body. Are you able to touch on what some of those might be and, you know, what, what, what is your mushroom course about? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked about that. That was a nice kind of surprise because it is actually one of our more recent courses um, and it's quite in depth. Um, and so, you know, quite in depth about uses growing mushrooms, if that's someone, something that interests folks, you know, not everyone taking the course is necessary to do that, um, but it's included. But to answer um, about sort of liver support and mushrooms, um, there are a number of different mushrooms that grow on trees um, that are called tonics because they sort of seem to support the immune system. They're non-toxic, um, but have these really interesting, um, complex, but generally beneficial effects of promoting liver health and hormonal balance and even sort of tonifying the endocrine system so i would say um, reishi mushroom which um, encompasses a few different species um, if you've seen those artist conks like the mushrooms that sort of grow straight out of the tree and look like a little oyster shell mm -hmm. not oyster mushroom something a little bit you know denser um, that's actually a relative of these of these reishi mushrooms. Usually we use the ones that are a little bit um, redder and darker in color. 
um, but reishi is a great one. Turkey tail, if, if, if people are living anywhere near woodland, they're so, so common. Um, and let's see, reishi, turkey tail, those are two like really great ones to think about. But honestly, like almost all the medicinal mushrooms seem to have some like liver um, supportive and also endocrine system supportive effects. So can kind of help our body deal with stress, recycle hormones within the body sort of in a more efficient and helpful way. Um, so that's definitely something we would find info on. So when it comes to mushrooms, like I live in California, Northern California, and we're in a region where you just don't forage mushrooms because there are too many really deadly versions that look like really safe versions. So yeah. I, I would, I would, I, all I teach my kids is like, if you see a mushroom, you don't touch it, like no matter what, because there's, yeah. there's too many varieties here that aren't great. Yeah. Um, however, when you see these mushrooms on the trees that are growing out like these discs, are, are, can you make a general statement that they all kind of belong to a certain class and that class is generally like non-poisonous, non-toxic, or is that too much of a generalization? You know, in that case, I'm actually definitely willing to, to go there. Like that's very smart because it's true that the... Um, generally speaking, at least sort of, let's say in North America, the mushrooms growing out of trees, if they're, you know, nice and kind of dense or like have that kind of shelf, if they're like a shelf fungus, um, those are typically, most of them are polypores. So if you were to look really close at their sort of underside, they've got pores um, and they're a little bit spongy underneath, harder on top. And so generally the polypores and the things that grow, certainly where we are in the Northeast, um, are generally non-poisonous. I might not say edible because they're tough, you know, but the nah. things that are, you know, made into like powders and decoctions, things of that nature. Mushrooms growing on the ground, um, definitely you want to be absolutely sure and have learned it like sort of out in the woods with someone else who really, really knows, um, except for like a few that are almost unmistakable. Um, so that that's a distinction we make as well sort of like which of these can are good sort of beginner to harvest mushrooms in which do you want to just you know um, make sure you're really an expert first. yeah you're an expert or you're with an expert and I, I really do think that I mean I've lived in a lot of different mushroom um, abundant regions this is the first place that I've been to that like there are stories in the local papers all the time about some tourist or someone who's like a mushroom expert came and had this mushroom and like just foraged it and died. Like it happens so often that it's really changed my mindset about mushrooms. So if you guys are ever in North California, don't try the mushroom thing. Just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, the North, the Pacific Northwest and West is is where a lot of this happens for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is, um, you know, as some of us are starting to age, there are certain things that we're like experiencing like spots. And in the series, we have talked about spots a little bit, but I would love for you to maybe just touch on like age spots, skin spots, any hyperpigmentation um, that you can touch on. And then um, maybe we can get into watching you make a recipe from the book, which we have to talk about the book. That's a whole other conversation, but we'll touch on it before Heather leaves us today. <laughs> yeah, so for age spots, um, like hyperpigmentation you mentioned, it is, a, I think it is probably a pretty tricky thing to see like a, a lot of change or immediate change in, but there are a couple of herbal ingredients that come up um, for me. One is milk thistle, which interestingly was one that we kind of touched on, um, not yet in our chat today, but earlier um, for, because internally it promotes liver health. And when it's used ex externally, it's thought that it might um, slightly lighten or sort of help to kind of renew and repair skin where it's applied. So milk thistle is one that sometimes uses the ingredients. Um, interestingly, comfrey root is sometimes used that way as well. 
Um, and then of course, any of the really like high antioxidant ingredients. And I would say that's something you want to do both like internally, you know, with a good diet and also, you know, potentially applying externally as well. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say kind of sticking with things like comfrey and milk thistle for that type okay. of thing. Now, I want, we talked about milk thistle seeds. Can you just talk about the different parts and how they're different? Yeah, yeah. So for the most part, we're going to use the seed. Um, it's this great big plant with a very interesting waxy leaf that looks like milk was spilled on it. So if you see a thistle in your yard or you're hiking in California and you find a thistle, probably not the milk thistle. It's a little bit rare and more often grown. Um, I think there are some uses of the root, but mostly we're using the seed. Um, and the seed could be um, consumed as like a powder. Uh, it can be, it's like a little bit nutty um, tasting, mm -hmm. like a, you know, sort of like a sesame, uh, not sesame, like a uh, sunflower seed kind of like consistency, flavor, et cetera, a little more bitter though. Um, so it could be consumed as a powder, um, can be, you know, when we are applying it topically, it's most often when the seed has been infused into another type of oil. Um, I don't know of oil being made from it, but being a seed, it's got lots of nice, you know, nutritive fats that will then go into a carrier really nicely. Um, so, yeah, so mostly we're talking about the seed, but different applications externally or internally. Great. So getting back to the egg spots and the recipe that you're going to show us. Yeah, so the recipe, should we jump in with the recipe? Um, actually, before we do, let's just talk about the book for a quick sec, because this is um, the Botanical Skincare book that I guess goes with the course. Yes. Um, at the Herbal Academy. And um, are, the, are the recipes in here like pretty easy to just do at home or can we expect to have to maybe acquire some like tools or machines or anything like that or hard to find ingredients? Because that seems to always be a theme with like at home herbals. Yeah, so I would say that everything in it is within the scope of um, like a kitchen setup. Um, that being said, some recipes have more advanced ingredients. Um, some are a bit more simple. We don't, uh, in, for, for our recipe book, we're not, I wouldn't say there's anything that requires any kind of special equipment beyond things like, you know, you might like an immersion blender or something like that, something that you're going to use again and again. Um, and also something that, you know, if you have just a regular blender, that's fine too. Um, we did all of these really with pretty simple kitchen equipment. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's and reassuring. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to need like distillation apparatus or any kind of sort of lab equipment or anything like that. We also... Um, we also made all of the ingredients um, in, me they're measured um, in sort of kitchen measurements. So whereas at some recipes you might see like weighing things um, yeah. exclusively, which is nice, especially if you're going to like, you know, like have a product line and you want things to be super exact and really replicated, you know, exactly and predictably time and time again. Um, but this is more for someone who's going to be learning. So yeah spoons, you know, cups, things of that nature. Yeah. For sure. So I think um, I just want to like take away from that, that if you are passionate about starting your own skincare line, this could be a great place to start. <laughs> we have, we have folks who have started with us, absolutely, who've um, developed product lines. So That's yeah, awesome. it's good to sort of, um, you have to start somewhere, right? So yeah. yeah, it's good to start with some things you can build your confidence with and learn while you're doing absolutely perfect okay so the recipe that you're making for us today it is to address what we um were talking about earlier eight spots eight spots or sort of uh like rough spots irritated we definitely have um yellow dock and burdock some kind of soothing that comfrey so those are a few of the right the ingredients that may you know address the concern that you brought up um, but also I would think we could, you know, we could consider these, you know, I've got a little bit of 
face mask, <laughs> you know, from wearing a face mask right now during COVID, a little bit of redness. Oh, yes. It's kind of diverse. It's going to help to sort of um, bring a little bit of attention um, to your circulation, to sort of renewal, um, wherever it's applied. It is kind of more of a spot treatment. Um, but certainly you could consider it for sort of age spots or for, you know, other sort of problem areas, irritation, et cetera. Perfect. Yeah. Show us. Yeah. So this is, um, I've got the herbs here. Um, and basically this recipe is super simple. Um, you are from this book going to be able to make like lotions and creams and things that are going to look a little bit more like a nice finer quality kind of cosmetic thing. But I didn't want to bring you into my kitchen. I wanted to just do it at a desk. So um, we're just going to be combining herbs. But I'll tell you about each of them. Um, I have neem. So a little bit of neem. Um, and this is a really pretty potent botanical that we know has um, antifungal properties, antiseptic. Um, also just has a little bit of kind of an enlivening and renewing. Um, in, in other words, I'd, I'd say it's going to kind of bring circulation um, to where it's applied. And it's, um, you know, a little, it's, it's one of the little bit more activating ingredients. It's also anti-inflammatory. So this is kind of a more potent ingredient, but I say also versatile. Um, if someone has a skin issue that they're not sure if it's like inflammation or a fungal issue, or maybe a little bit of both, it's nice because it kind of addresses either one. Um, but it certainly has been used in a variety of ways in skincare. This recipe is just in parts. So we have three ingredients that are two parts and three ingredients that are one part. I'm just going to do small amounts um, because it's just for demonstration. So we've got neem. So how much did you just put in there? That was like a yeah. teaspoon? I'm, I'm honestly just doing like a teaspoon and maybe yeah. half a teaspoon because we're just doing a little for demo. I could put all of this in because I sort of compare them as two parts. So there's twice as much of these on the um, back set as there are on these smaller containers. But I just want to mix up a little bit and then we'll moisten it with a little bit of aloe gel. Um, but I don't want us to have more powder than the aloe gel will take. So we're kind of estimating a little. So this one is echinacea root. So echinacea, if you know, I often say if people have heard of one herb, it's echinacea. More often, we're taking it internally. Um, actually, it is an herb that is sometimes used for age spots and things, you know, like you were mentioning. Um, and I think that's partially because it does have this sort of like activating effect in the skin. Internally, we take it as an immune booster. Externally, or even as sort of like a first aid type treatment, it seems to bring circulation um, and sort of activate the skin. So we'll put in just a little bit of, and this is the echinacea root. Um, you could, you know, if you had like the leaf and flower, that's, um, that's actually pretty similarly useful, but I like the root for, um, you know, you could use either, but I've, I've tended to like the root for some skincare items. We have comfrey. Now this is one that I did mention, um, when we were talking about, um, sort of, you know, ingredients sometimes used in sort of aging remedies, um, milk thistle seed and comfrey are sometimes used. We have the leaf. Yet another herb that, you know, both the leaf or the root are used. Um, and in our recipe, we have, uh, we have the leaf, which has a little bit more sort of, um, well, certainly is rich in chlorophyll and perhaps some antioxidants as well um, in the sort of pigment of the leaf. So we'll just put a little bit of comfrey in as well. Um, this is one that there's a little controversy about using internally, but externally we like it. We have yellow dock. So this one's almost not, you know, my shirt's kind of upstaging it a little, <laughs> but it's, it's yellow. It's very yellow. And yellow. this is one of those great liver activating herbs um, and also sort of renewal repair type of herbs externally. So yellow dock root, it's actually a really common garden plant or weed, um, but we'll put a little bit in. And this one is also really rich in like antioxidant pigments. Um, but if we took it internally, it would also have those nice, you know, liver benefits. Burdock is pretty similar, so not as nice and bright, um, but burdock is sort of nice and like moistening, hydrating. It's one of the ingredients that kind of will help sort of hold and draw moisture to your skin. Um, so it's also a little bit smoother, you know, one of, it's going to like make things a little bit smoother. Um, it's what we call demulcent. So a little bit of burdock. 
Um, and then we have turmeric, which is super bright, not upstaged by my shirt. Okay. Um, so we need to talk about turmeric because I've actually been seeing a lot of recipes about turmeric mm -hmm. and I cook with turmeric. I make the, you know, turmeric lattes. Okay. It is so staining. I don't want to put it on my face. Yeah. I'm going to be yellow. So this one is definitely more of like a spot treatment or COVID times <laughs> kind okay. of. Kind of okay, I just want everyone to know if you're going to try this, you may be a little yellow for a period. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I was thinking of that little disclaimer too. So this is more of a sort of like a, you know, practical applications, first aid remedy type of thing, but not like a every day before you go out. In working with this plant as an herbalist, I've had times when my hands were totally yellow because sometimes yeah. it's just not practical to have the gloves on. And then the next day, you know, people are worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this one is, uh, will be staining. So um, this one you could take or leave in recipes. And you know, we, in our monographs about the plants, you learn that about it too. So since I'm just at home with my, you know, mask skin, I'm going to put a little turmeric in. Um, but this is one that's a really great anti-inflammatory as well as activating, and so that's one of the reasons that you might decide to do grated. You could also use fresh grated turmeric root, um, which is going to have just, you know, a little bit different scent um, and feel, but definitely um, if you can get fresh turmeric, that's nice to have as well. But yes, yeah, staining for sure, no doubt about that. Um, so we have, you know, nothing too exciting, just a blend, and then in our recipe, we include um, sesame oil as a possibility for drier skin. Um, and in Ayurveda, that's kind of one of the more like warming, um, moistening herbs, or herbs, oils. Um, my skin does not respond well to that thick or that rich of an oil. So um, in our recipe, we also have the alternate of aloe gel. So really, this one is just a little bit um, to sort of moisten and create a paste. Now, your aloe gel is a little green. I actually pressed it from an aloe plant. So okay, I was gonna say. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, if we were doing this to make um, a lot of it or something to share, um, you'd probably want to go with like an aloe gel product that doesn't have any solids and does have actually a little bit of preservative, even though we don't love preservatives. You got to have them in certain products. Um, and so mine is actually, uh, I had a little bit of aloe gel and then pressed a little bit from some leaves to add to the amount. So we get a little green there, but usually it'd be like clear, just a touch of green. And aloe is one of those plants that you can literally have anywhere, indoor, outdoor, depending on the climate. It's so easy. It basically doesn't stop growing and it's like so many uses and benefits. So get an aloe plant guys. Definitely. Just get one. Definitely. And I was glad I had it <laughs> to kind of boost my, because if we had put all these powders in, we would need as much. So then you get something that is, you know, pretty rugged looking, but going to be really active. So this is a nice little spot type of treatment. Um, and certainly, you know, you just apply it, leave it on for like 10 minutes or something like that um, until it's a little bit dry. Um, but certainly if you're thinking of making like facial lotions, creams, even a couple really, really simple, basic sort of lipsticks and cosmetic items, we have those. Um, and they're going to be, they're going to be simple, um, but many of them are much more sort of refined product than this. But this way we talked about herbs. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Well, Heather, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing with us. Guys, we're going to include the recipe as well as Heather's links and how you can find her in the Herbal Academy as well. Um, any final words to our audience before we say bye? Um, I would just say if you're interested in herbs, um, I think a lot of times people feel overwhelmed because if you, if you learn one herb, then you, know, you learn a little bit about it. Um, oftentimes people are ready to kind of like shoot you down or tell you what more they know about it or what different, you know, what something they know differently about it. Um, but I would say that it's a very approachable thing to learn and, you know, you don't have to be an expert on all of it. Um, you just have to start somewhere. And it's been really gratifying for all of us, um, all of my peers who are herbalists. So I love that. And thank you for saying that because it, it is true. I mean, when we, it, in a way, it's how we relate to one another by saying, oh, I know about that too. 
but it can feel overwhelming at times. So thank you for touching on that. Heather Irvine, you guys, thanks so much for joining us and uh, we will see you on the flip side. Thank you as well.